Happy Sabbath. It's good to be here today worshiping God. Only 1,900 people received the invitation. They were an exclusive group of people. However, it's estimated that millions of people around the world watched at least part of the event. The invitation read, the Lord Chamberlain is commanded by the Queen to invite, and the sp space is blank for the person's name, to the marriage of His Royal Highness Prince William of Wales, KG, with Miss Catherine Middleton at Westminster Abbey on February 29, 2011, at 11 a.m. A reply is requested to State Invitations Secretary Lord Chamberlain's office, Buckingham Palace, London. Dress, uniform, morning coat, or lounge suit. I'm guessing that none of us here in this congregation today received one of these treasured invitations. We are commoners in colloquial terms. We aren't royalty. Oh, somewhere in our distant past, we may be related to someone famous, but we aren't that famous. One day, near the end of Jesus' ministry here on earth, he told a parable about another invitation. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. And we'll begin with verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said. Notice that Jesus spoke to them again. Who is them? What does it mean that he spoke to them again? The context for the parable is the cleansing of the temple the day before. The chief priests and the scribes were upset at the praise and thanksgiving that were being ascribed to Jesus from those who were healed and from the children. The next day, he saw the fig tree with leaves only, no figs. He stated that it should not have fruit any longer and immediately it withered. He then entered the temple and began teaching the people. The chief priests and elders began questioning him about his authority to teach. He enters into some teaching moments with them, trying to lovingly convict them so that their eyes can be open to their true condition. He tells them the parable of the two sons and the parable of the landowner, and the story of the chief cornerstone. The, chief, the priests and the Pharisees realize that Jesus was speaking about them. So now, once again, Jesus is driving home his point. He is trying to open their hearts. And he tells them the story of the great invitation. Verse 2, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. This is the first invitation the Jews had been blessed and called. God, through the Old Testament times, had his loyal and faithful servants who had extended the invitation of grace. Moses, even before he died, he told them, know then that it's not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this land to possess for you, for you are a stubborn people, Deuteronomy 9.6. Even then their hearts had been hard and stubborn and they'd been unwilling 
to go to the wedding feast. He continues the parable. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who've been invited, behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. This is the second invitation. Again, the king in his great love and grace extends the invitation through his faithful and loyal servants. Listen, there's going to be this incredible wedding feast where divinity and humanity will be joined together. Please, come. Everything is ready. There's no charge. There's no obligations. Isaiah the prophet wrote through inspiration, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And what was the response? Jesus continued, but they paid no attention and went their way. One to his own farm, another to his own business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. Can you imagine? The king extends an invitation for the marriage of his son to have the honor to be invited should have been a privilege to refuse unthinkable. What a slap in the face. What disrespect. The invitation went unheeded. They focused instead on business, on making ends meet. They were indifferent to the invitation. And there were even those who mistreated the king's servants. We know that many prophets had suffered under the hands of God's supposed peoples. Zechariah had been killed between the porch and the altar. And Jesus, seeing into the future, knew that they would kill Stephen and the apostle James and persecute and kill others. And again, Jesus continues. But the king was enraged. And he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Here Jesus is predicting what will come to pass in just a few years. He will send the armies of Rome to destroy these murderers and set Jerusalem on fire. They are hearing the results of their spurning of the king of the universe's invitation. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding's ready. But those who were invited were not worthy. Jesus still longs to unite divinity with humanity. And he still longs for us to come to his banqueting table. The invitation still goes on. The wedding is ready. If your invitation was spurned twice, would you still go on inviting? But that's the kind of God of, who is the king of the universe. His heart overflows with love and compassion. He sees us. We may be indifferent or callous towards him, but the invitation is extended again and again. And he says, go therefore to the main highways. And as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Notice those who were invited those on the main highways, the streets, the evil, the good. Friends, the invitation is not just for those who look like they have their act together. 
It is for everyone. If you're feeling broken or discouraged, if you feel that God couldn't possibly want you because of your past or your present, if you feel like someone in your family is hopeless, if you feel like someone is unimportant, if you feel like someone is addicted and couldn't possibly be delivered from their enslaving habit, if you feel that someone doesn't look good enough or smell good or doesn't act good enough, the king wants them to come. He wants to join his divinity with their humanity. Who do you despise? Who do you hate? Who do you look down on? And who irritates you? God loves them. And he wants them to come to his banqueting table. And he wants you there too. The story continues. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw there a man not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Like the invitation for Prince William and Kate's Middleton's wedding, there's a dress requirement. You can't come in your jeans and your overalls. You can't come in your scrubs. You can't come in your beach outfit. But unlike Prince William and Kate Middleton's wedding, you can't come in your designer clothes. You can't shop at Neiman Marcus or Harrods. You can't wear someone else's borrowed clothes. You can't rent a tux or a special designer clothes. No matter how much you pay or how well you sew, your clothes won't cut it. The fact is, the king provides the wedding garment. It is, the, it is God's robe of righteousness. It's the character of Christ. That's why anyone can afford to come. Jesus paid the price for that costly garment. He shed his blood so that you and I can wear it. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were clothed with a holy light until they fell. It was only then that they realized that they were naked and needed clothing. And they tried covering themselves with fig leaves. But fig leaves didn't work. Just so with us. Our righteousness, our good works, our good deeds aren't enough. We can't possibly adequately cover our unrighteousness. We need the character of Christ. Jesus clothed Adam and Eve with sheepskin from that very first death of a lamb. Because the wages of sin is death. That day in the garden, a lamb died for Adam and for Eve's sin. God taught them through that sacrifice that their, that their clothing is Jesus' death and life that covers them and us. We have an opportunity to unite with Christ and allow him to give us the mind and heart of Christ. Did you notice the man was speechless? There was nothing he could say. Excuses were meaningless. He had the same invitation, the same opportunity to wear Jesus' garment. But he chose not to. Ellen White, in the book, Christ's Object Lessons, wrote, The man who came to the feast without a wedding garment represents the condition of many in our world today. They profess to be Christians and lay claims to the blessings and privileges of the gospel, yet they feel no need for a transformation of character. They have never felt true repentance for sin. They do not realize their need of Christ or exercise faith in him. 
They've not overcome their hereditary or cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing. Yet they think that they are good enough in themselves. And they rest upon their own merits instead of trusting in Christ. Hearers of the word. They come to the banquet, but they've not put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. What a sad commentary. Do we profess to be Christians yet have not allowed Jesus to transform self? Are we self-satisfied with our condition, but we don't really see how blind and naked we are? Then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Today, there are several lessons that we can reflect on. Number one, God longs for each of us to accept the invitation to the banquet. He longs for each of us to unite our humanity with his divinity you know, we may be church members for years, or we may be newbies. We may be good, or we may be evil. We may have spurned his invitation before, but we've all been invited to share in the bountiful table. John the Revelator wrote and pictured this so well with these compelling words where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him or her and will dine with him or her and he or she with me. You know, it's possible for us to be like the Pharisees and the religious leaders to be in the church, but still not accept the invitation. It's possible for us to be gods of materialism or gods of pleasure and bit busyness, and spurn the invitation he graciously provides. For even the religious leaders of Christ's day believed that they were doing the right thing. Pride, self-reliance, self-importance were barriers to surrender. Point two, God has provided us with the garment of salvation. Isaiah the prophet wrote in Isaiah 61, 10 and 11, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adecks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as the garden causes the things sown in it to spring up. So the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is such incredibly good news. Doesn't matter what we've done. Doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter our social status doesn't matter how rich or how poor we are, doesn't matter how good or evil we are, God offers you and me his perfect robe of righteousness. Amen. He offers you and me his spotless character. Your clothes, they're filthy, Dirty and stinky, hate to tell you. They may be stylish. Oh, oh, you may like the design. But they are still filthy, dirty, and stinky. There's nothing in your closet that compares to Christ's character. That kind of exchange is mind-boggling. You know, there are people who can't conceive how God could offer his robe to someone who hurt them, to someone who's killed their family member, to someone who's evil. 
But that's what God offers. It's the good news for Joseph's brothers. It's the good news for Moses, who killed an Egyptian. It's the good news for Elijah, a discouraged prophet who runs from Jezebel. It's the good news for King David, who lusted, committed adultery, and murdered to get his way. And it's good news for you and I. Whatever brokenness we've experienced. Point three. Jesus desires us, his servants, to go and offer the invitation to everyone, everywhere. Wow. If you're healed from leprosy, would you have a story to tell? If you were a paralytic and could now walk and carry your bed, would you have something to say about your healer? If you were dead in sin and alive in Christ Jesus, would you have something to share? If you had a night encounter with Jesus, would you offer to bury your Lord? If you had walked with Jesus for three and a half years and then denied him three times, and he still forgave you, would you feed his lambs? What has Jesus done for you? Has he changed your life? Has he freed you from sin? Has he taken your guilt and shame? Has he taken your condemnation? He knows everything about you, and he still loves you and calls you friend. As most of you know, our son Anthony is getting married in about six weeks. We received the invitation in the mail, and we've RSVP'd. Now, you think that's funny because he's our son. But I want to tell you, there is nothing short of sickness, death, or an accident that would keep us from being there. However, there's a greater invitation offered to each of us. The king of the universe invites us to a marriage feast. And he's providing the clothes, the food. It's ready now. And he invites us to unite with him in spreading the invitation to the highways to the streets, to the good, to the evil. He commands us to go and compel them to come in. Oh, we can't force anyone, but we can compel them. We can say, I have tasted of his love, grace, and healing, and I know that you would be blessed. If you too would meet this God who loves you, won't you come and see, come and taste, come and enjoy our amazing healer and lover, creator and redeemer? Today, I want to challenge you, friends, servants of the King, to go share what Jesus has done for you And compel them to come and see, come and taste the amazing riches of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jude concludes his epistle in this manner in Jude, verses 20 to 24. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some, have mercy with fear, even um, hating even the garments polluted by the flesh. 
May we today repent, find healing for our sin-sick souls, and accept his perfect character. May we share Jesus. May we have mercy. May we snatch others from the fire. And now I want to use the benediction found at the end of James. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy as to our only God, our, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all and now and evermore. Amen.